This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, episode number 21. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before I get into the show today, I wanted to remind you to follow us on Instagram at instagram.com slash wetflyswing. In today's episode, I interview Matt Clare, a spay casting expert and all-around fishy dude. Matt clarifies the single-hand spay game for steelhead and trout. We talk about some unique spay casts for tight situations, why you likely have what you already need and why he's a big fan of setting the hook for steelhead. He describes growing up in a camper on the Madison River, his 2.5x formula for choosing a line, and why guiding is one of the hardest jobs on the planet. Don't miss this show as Matt describes how he turned a California ground squirrel infestation into a secret weapon for taking summer steelhead on the Deschutes. So, without further ado, here's Matt Clara. How's it going, Matt? Great, great. How are you doing today? Good, good. Yeah, we're getting uh, we're getting some sunny skies out here, so it's uh, it's definitely you know <laughs> it's not the perfect uh, winter steelhead weather, but but it's uh, it's nice to have some some warmth and a little break from the rain. How about you? Oh, that's that's great. It, we're um, we're actually finally thawing out here at the end of a pretty tough long winter, cold one here in in uh, in Montana, and uh-huh. kind of counting the days to the first uh, little bit of lake fishing that we're going to be able to do, and and water temps warming up a little bit, some of the valley snow melting finally. So nice, yeah. Things things are looking up. Awesome, awesome. Well, we'll get into all this. I want to hear more about where you're coming from now, and uh, maybe you could just start us off first kind of you know where how you got into fly fishing and we're going to talk a lot about steelhead fishing too here i know you have a history there and maybe you can kind of bring us back how you got into steelhead and then how you got to where you are now with uh big sky anglers sure well um i guess start at the end i i'm currently living in helena montana and uh, i got got here kind of in in a roundabout way but um, originally from central New York state, a town called Rome and, uh, got into fishing, you know, as, as early as I can remember, um, both my folks fly fish and, uh, we would travel their, their, um, their career were both junior high school teachers. And so we had summers off and, uh, in the summer we, uh, lived in an RV just outside, uh, just outside of West Yellowstone, Montana, uh, right on the Madison River. Wow. Um, spent a bit of time as well up on Rock Creek outside of Missoula. But um, kind of my my summer home away from home was an RV uh, on the banks of the Madison, and that was that was kind of my introduction to um, fly fishing and, and as well as Montana. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, it's, it's about as lucky as a, a, yeah. a, little, a little kid could be, um, if they're into the, the outdoors and fishing and, and playing with bugs and, and yep. all that stuff. So, um, yeah, thank my folks for that, of course. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, I came to really, really love Montana and, um, throughout my college career when I was, I went to college back East and uh but spent the summers in the same area of montana i worked for a couple of years uh as a cook um and then when i started getting yelled at for talking fishing too much uh to our customers at the restaurant i decided maybe i should probably look into something else and ended up working at uh at a local fly shop and eventually becoming a guide uh for a few years um in southwest montana and yellowstone and uh, eventually kind of decided guiding wasn't for me. And uh, I went back to grad school at Montana State and uh, got a degree in civil engineering and kind of specializing in stream restoration, water resources, natural resources, stuff like that. And and since then, I've been a, 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 an engineer and a, a stream restoration consultant and um kind of all through this this whole thing have kept my ties with um my friends and mm-hmm. uh in west yellowstone and and i guess after a few years i i've looped back around and i've always helped them a little bit 
um, with their own businesses, you know, writing websites and things like that. But, but now I, I, uh, am not full time, but I, I am the official, I guess, social media, media manager for, uh, my friends that own big sky anglers now. Oh, cool. I probably left something out, but yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. So what was your, so we definitely uh, talk a lot about steelhead here. What is, and I know, I mean, I've got a, I got modern steelhead flies sitting here on my, you know, sitting here, <laughs> hitting where, here, uh, here with me now. But um, I mean, you're in that book, and you've got a good connection to steelhead. Where, where, how did all that develop? And and you know, and I know Brian Chow, you you know, and all yep. that stuff. How, how did, uh, you know, how did you get involved there? And when did you make the move out away from steelhead a little bit? Well, so uh, I guess there's a, there was a move towards Steelhead, and then there was a move away from Steelhead. Um, I lived in Bozeman, and I was working in Bozeman, Montana, um, after school, after grad school, and and eventually um, moved to Portland, Oregon, uh, for a work opportunity. And I, I moved there in 2006, and I lived in in Portland from 2006 until well 2014 really mm-hmm. um and then i spent actually spent a year in southern california my my wife was doing some training and i was down there but then after that we uh we managed to work our way back uh to montana um and we live here in helena now so i basically you know that was the yeah that was the montana to oregon and then back to montana um you know, as far as, as far as my connection with steelhead, um, I actually started steelhead fishing, um, in 2001, mm-hmm. um, growing up, I guess prior to that, I had done a little bit of the, um, great lakes type steelhead fishing, um, kind of near where I grew up back in New York. Um, and then in, in 2001, um, I had been working in a fly shop for a little bit and one of our customers was super excited. I think he was from Bend or something and he was super excited to, to talk about his local fishing. And, and I think he got me and, and another friend of mine, Travis, super duper fired up about it. And, uh, we did our first trip and, and I think we ended up going out and fishing the Grand Ron River in 2001. And, and that was my, that was kind of my intro to it. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. And then, so I, I really, I really enjoyed that type of fishing. Um, and you know, when I moved out to Oregon, it was, it was just everywhere. Yeah. Um, and so I almost, um, with the exception of kind of uh, trips back to see my, my friends and family here in Montana, I, I basically didn't really trout fish, um, much at all the whole time that I lived in Oregon and, and really did a lot of steelhead, a lot of salmon, um, mm-hmm. uh, and and stuff out there. And, and, mm-hmm. and yeah. Yeah. So, you, and, and, uh, and you obviously made a good name for yourself. I mean, I had, uh, had Jay Nicholas on the show in episode uh, three here, and uh, you know he was talking about a lot of the books he he's written, and uh, you know the modern steel flies is definitely one that uh, I'm just kind of reading through. It's a real, it's a great book, you know. It goes through a lot of the the background and history of some of the people. How how did you find yourself in there with amongst some of the the biggest uh, steelhead fly tires you know out there? Yeah, well, certainly, um, you know, it, it very humbling to to be included in that. Um, my introduction, I guess, to to that was um, you mentioned Brian Chow a little earlier. Brian and I have been really good friends. Um, gosh, 2007 or 2008, we met very soon after I I moved to to Portland. Uh, he was there as well. Um, struck up a great friendship, and our our life paths have somehow paralleled each other in many ways, and we, all, we hit it off on on in regards to many things, including fly tying. And, um, I guess when, when Rob and Jay were compiling, um, folks to include into the, into their book, um, they asked Brian if they had anybody else in mind and he was, he was kind enough to throw my name in the hat and, uh, yeah, I, I, it was neat. Um, yeah. Talk, talk to those guys, send in a few flies and, and I think they liked them and ended up in the book is pretty cool to see. 
Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. Nice. So yeah, I've been uh, talking <clears throat> quite a bit, connecting with people, talking about spay casting and different rods and lines and just trying to, you know, give some of the, you know, listeners out there an idea of, you know, if they're new to it, things like that. I mean, what was, you know, your transition? I'm always interested to hear like the transition from single handed rods to spay. I mean, what, what was that like for you? Was it a steelhead? Is that about that 2001 time when you started making that transition? Um, it was, so it was actually, um, 1999 and this, and this is, this is like pretty interesting, I think, because I, I came into spay, um, kind of backwards. Um, I was living in West Yellowstone, Montana at the time. And, um, if folks are familiar with some of the local fisheries there, um, the Madison river in, Mm -hmm. in Yellowstone park, flows out of Yellowstone Park and into Hebgen Lake. And in the fall, uh, there's a pretty famous uh, pretty famous run of lake fish that come up out of Hebgen Lake into the Madison River in the park. And um, rainbows and browns, um, you know, the browns are kind of on their uh, initiation of their spawning run. Um, there's actually fall spawning rainbows and also rainbows that spend the full, you know, winter or, or they're, they're up chasing eggs and things like that. But, um, this, that fishery, you know, we do a lot of streamer fishing and also do a lot of swinging of soft tackles. And, um, the, the shop that I was working for at the time, uh, one of my, um, one of my colleagues there was a, a big steelheader and, and um, a big spay caster. And we got talking about it and I, I was, you know, I got to, I got to try that. <laughs> and so um, this guy, Chuck Ford is his name, took, took me out with, uh, with one of his steelhead spay rods and gave me a little spay lesson. And uh, I ended up borrowing a rod from somebody, I think it was like a 14 foot nine weight or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, Something, you know, big, big long <laughs> could, line. <laughs> yeah. With a big, long, you know, like a wolf triangle tape or spay line or a mid, a mid spay mm-hmm. or something on there. And, and, you know, I spent the rest of the fall, um, catching 14 to 20 inch trout on a, <laughs> on a 14 foot nine weight. But I mean, wow. you know, hammering, just hacking out casts and trying to learn is, you know, just, yep terrible casting but every once in a while you know it worked out and and it was super fun and and that's so that's how i came into it um yeah and then um you know a year or so later started to think more about steelhead and and got myself a setup uh, a little bit more appropriate setup 13 foot seven weight which at the time was probably one of the lightest things you could get Mm -hmm. now is totally totally the norm i would say for steelhead yep um and uh yeah practiced and practiced and and hooked myself and all that and did a bunch of trout and and then like i said i that that fall in in 2001 um made a trip out to the grand ron for the first time and hmm. yeah yep and you hacked away at it and finally figured out the, all the we spent about four days fishing what we thought was the good steelhead water and all we caught were trout and finally figured out we needed to fish the water that we thought was way, way too slow for any respectable fish to hang out in. <laughs> and it turned out that was the exact spot where, where steelhead all were. Nice. Uh, yep. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> And by too slow, I mean, you know, classic, you know, waist to chest, walking speed. Yep. Basically perfect steelhead water. Perfect stuff. So you went in there not knowing much and just happened across some of the best water. Yeah. For a kid coming from Montana that was used to fishing, you know, a river like the Madison, known for quick, jumpy, Mm. riffle water and and basically spent a few days trying to find that exact water where we caught our fish out of here in Montana and yeah we we caught a bunch of nice you know 10 11 12 inch trout probably a bunch of steelhead small on that trip until we moved into the that like i said that ridiculously slow deep water (laughs) um 
then we started finding a couple of steel it was, it was pretty great thinking back on it actually I haven't, yeah. I haven't thought about that trip in a while that is cool so the grand ron i mean that's definitely on the east side and then you made your way out to kind of towards the portland area what what would you consider for for steelhead your your home river you know i know you're not in the area now but when you were out and yeah yeah um well i think you you brought up the east side and i i think that was my introduction to steelhead was east side rivers and and so i i think i you know formed some sort of bond with with those east side summer rivers Mm -hmm. and um when i lived in in portland and actually even uh, before, um, I lived to Port- in Portland, I had traveled, uh, to the Deschutes, um, to fish for steelhead there. And if there was any river, I think when we were emailing about this, I, I, I said, if you asked any yeah. one of my friends, what my, what my home steelhead river was, every single one of them would say the Deschutes. So that's what I'm going to say here. Nice. The Deschutes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. We had, uh, um, Tom Larimer was on in, uh, episode 11 and he, uh, yep. broke down some, some summer, uh, some midday, a lot of it was on midday stuff. So yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll dig in a little more, uh, maybe if we have time here on, on the Deschutes. I, I did have some questions, I actually just had a question, uh, today and it was, uh, somebody who was actually in, I think Wisconsin and they were talking about how it's so tight there and brushy and like, you know, what are good casts to you or what are some weird casts maybe to use to get your, your fly out there? And, and that kind of brought me into thinking about, you know, you and how, you know, a focus is on these single hand spade rods. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little about maybe what, you know, if, if somebody wanted to get started, say just for trout fishing, um, to start off with in single hand spade, what, what sort of outfit might they get as far as a rod reel line? And then, sure. and then if you know any, cast that might help that guy in wisconsin that's trying to to cast with a bunch of brush around him and and would would the would a single hand spay or something similar be good for that yeah yeah there's a couple few questions there i guess but i I think um i've done a couple of presentations on this this topic we had a little spay event uh through big sky anglers last fall we're gonna have another one and and i I did a presentation at it last fall um, are those online anywhere? Are those, is that, or do you have anything where people can check that out or something similar? Um, yeah, I can, I can, uh, I'll send you a link to that if oh, that perfect. works. Yep. We've, we've yep. got a, we've just got to save the date for that event. Oh, gotcha. Uh, cool. Cool. Currently I'll, it's, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll put a, uh, this show is going to be episode, uh, that we're on here is 21. So, uh, wetflyswing.com slash 21. And then in the show notes, we'll have a link here that, that you can get me. Awesome. Yep. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, I guess the 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 presentation and the the event was pretty cool because we had um, a handful of presenters and um, you know we had Simon Gosworth there teaching kind of oh, nice. the basics of spay cast, which is about as great as you can gr- get. Um, and and so there were a series of presenters that worked with two hundred rods, and, and then I came in last and. Basically, the gist of my presentation was um, spay casting and spay techniques using single-handed rods. And I think what I what I wanted to tell everybody, and and this goes right in with your question, is that you asked, what well, what setup do you need? And, yeah. and my answer for that is if you have a, a rod, a fly rod that you fish with for trout, um, you you probably have what you need um hmm. you know you, just like anything in fly fishing you can become ultra specialized but if you have your standard issue and um nine foot five weight yep nine foot six weight you know um rod like that you can use spay casts with that uh in many many different ways um and i think you can um you know improve your fishing or or you know, add a, add a component to it where you can maybe reach some different water, and enjoy it a little better. And, mm-hmm. um, and not just, uh, swinging streamers or swinging soft tackles. I mean, I think you can use spay casts when you're, you're fishing dry flies and tight quarters and you need a little bit more distance. You can definitely do it when you're nymphing, um, with indicators or without, um, you know, when I'm nymphing, I, I, probably use a snake roll Hmm. when i'm nymphing more than any other cast Mm -hmm. um and so yeah i don't i don't think people need to you know if they have general trout gear i don't think you need to go out and and buy a new kit if they want to 
dabble in single handed spay casting. Um, yeah. And does that go for the same thing with a line, just your normal, uh, six weight, you know, for, uh, weight line for your rod is fine to use or is there a more specialized you know kind of like how you have the skagit and scandy sort of stuff for steelhead the, there there's there yeah so your your standard line is usually it, it, it can work fine it's going to have limitations um it, it's worth thinking about um how the spay cast works and then the taper of of line so a lot of modern kind of standard single hand floating lines um have a lot of their weight at the front end. They're designed to kind of load up at short, short range and maybe turn over some heavy stuff with an overhead cast. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're, you know, you're, you're essentially throwing the short heavy line out front and then kind of shooting line behind it. Um, but the difference between an overhead cast and a spay cast is that, you know, in a spay cast, the, the, that tip of the tip of your fly line is probably sitting down there more or less on the water. And the weight that you need to, to load the rod, therefore, is is not actually at the rod. So if you can find a modern uh, modern fly line that has a taper um, that's kind of fatter towards the um, the real end of the head mm-hmm. versus fatter towards the leader end of the head, generally speaking, those are going to be a little easier um, to initiate your your basic spay cast with. Um, thinking about Oh, what are, um, like an airflow, um, there's, there, um, six sense lines that are built on the Delta taper. That's mm-hmm. a good one. Um, any, anything with a little bit longer belly, honestly, if you have an old double taper line, those are excellent mm-hmm. lines for single hand spay casting, yeah. um, up to a point, you know, if you, if your objective is to throw a couple soft tackles, throw some dries, you know, maybe just nymphing short range. Um, those are going to work great. And mm-hmm. you can, you can learn and practice the basics with that. Um, and then you can, you can build from there. I know, you know, um, there are some new specific single hand spay lines that are coming out that are, they're actually fairly similar, um, to existing lines that I was just describing a little bit more weight on the back end of the head. I know Rio's got one coming out and mm-hmm. or it's out. Um, and those are, those are great lines too. Um, I think if you're looking at wanting to approach a river with a single hand and rod, um, only to swing streamers or something like that, you can, you can then get a lot more specialized and look at some of the, um, kind of micro skagit type, fly lines that are available these days um you know stuff that's essentially like skagit style heads that are shorter you know okay 11 feet 12 feet 13 feet um you know uh i you know all the brands make different ones i think like opsd commando is a popular one Mm -hmm. um airflow scout is another one rio's got a i think they call it the trout max I'm um, pretty sure SA has one. I can't think of yeah. the name off the top of my head. And they have those lines in various weights. So you could, could you fish them? Um, yeah. I mean, steelhead as, uh, as well as trout. I mean, I guess. We're you, talking, yeah, you could. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they have grain weights, you know, down as low as 150 grains for a, for the shooting head part. And then on up, you know, up above 300 grains, um, which you'd probably, you know, put on like a seven or eight weight single handed rod. Okay. Um, okay. And do you see a, a time of just thinking more on steelhead? I mean, obviously you've got the, the 13 foot seven weight and then you got the switch rods. I mean, when yep. might you use a single hand spade rod? I guess I'm thinking something, maybe that guy in Wisconsin tight end might be a, a good place to, to use that as opposed to a switch. Yeah. I mean, you can, I mean, I think part of it is honestly just, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, the reason I picked up a spare rod for the first time was it looked fun. And, 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 you know, I could, I could say the opposite too, you know, if you're, if you're a steelheader and all you've really, really done is fish two handed rods, but maybe you've got a, uh, a rod sitting in your closet there, you know, mm-hmm. they're a capable, a capable fishing tool. Um, you know, smaller water, or just if you, if you want to just fish the single hander. Um, I think I'd, I'd interject a, a, a comment here about 
has to do with kind of if you had a you know what's a what's a really good rod for um single and spay i think uh length makes it easier yeah. you know the same reason that on a two-handed rod you know a longer two-handed rod you know makes it easier for distance um and my personal preference i would say would be a 10-foot single-handed rod okay yep um you know just moves moves the line around a little bit easier um and allows you to kind of um command the water a little bit better take advantage of of those those short skagit heads a little bit better Mm -hmm. um and you know i think a lot of guys out there probably that have been stealing for a long time probably have a dusty 10 foot 7 weight or 10 foot 8 weight or something there in the in the closet and and (laughs) you know maybe something new inspires them you know make make something old new again and and that's cool get that get that old rod back out and and Yep, and fool around with it again. Um, yeah, you're hit, you're hitting right on because I do have a, that dusty old ten foot uh, uh, eight weight. I used to use a lot for nymphing, but I haven't been you know haven't done much nymphing for steelhead in a while. So it's uh, that might be a good, and it's got kind of that that knob on the end too, kind of the fighting butt that would be great to use just to do some some spay casting. Yeah, and, and you know on on medium to small water, I, I don't find single hand rods to be any sort of really disadvantage um you can incorporate a haul into a single hand and spay cast Mm -hmm. um which is pretty neat and and again with some of these modern if you know if if your main thing is maybe throwing some little leeches on a sink tip some of these modern skagit lines are pretty um pretty incredible at at doing that um Mm -hmm. yeah um and can be really fun and at the same time I, i think um you know, some of the single hand standard single handed lines like your steelhead taper type stuff that you'll you'll have kind of a longer yeah longer head that's designed for kind of longer throws and in distance mending. Those are usually all really good single handed lines. So if you know, if you find yourself out in summer steelhead country and, and itching to throw the single hander again, yeah. You can throw you can throw those rods and, and throw really good spay and roll casts with those rods. Um and just kind of, you know, maybe bring back a few memories or, or you know, yeah. work on some new skills or something like that. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. Yeah, I was just thinking that rod I have that's collecting dust in there is a, yeah, I think it's an eight weight. But uh, so yeah, I think the line's pretty much toast. So just to uh, uh, verify that what you're saying before, so a good line. If I was to just go pick up a good line, and I wanted to use it just for kind of doing you know steelhead and smaller waters, say you know kind of small coastal streams so mm-hmm. do you so is there a good steel headline you might recommend just to go out and have one where you can do some good um kind of cover your bases as far as you know maybe a skagit type line or something like that i yeah i mean a, like a skagit type line I, like i said i kind of mentioned a few and yeah and, and they're all they're all pretty darn all good, pretty good. I, and and there's a, you know there's only so much you can do i think in in a short head length taper wise um, but yeah, those ones that I like that I mentioned, I, I'm the, the scientific anglers one is slipping my mind, but yeah. there's the, yeah, I can... you know, the Rio trout max, okay. um, they're shorter The you know, the airflow Skagit is another one or the, excuse me, the airflow scout is another one. Perfect. Um, your OPST commandos that, that kind of style of line. And, and, and in my personal experience with doing this, I've found that, you know, if you go back to the old school kind of Skagit formula or whatever, where you, you know, you look for your head, head length plus your tip length. Um, if you can get that combined length somewhere around for me personally, around two and a half times the length of the rod, Mm -hmm. I'm really happy with that. So if I've got a, you know, a 10 foot rod, two and a half times, that's 25. So, you know, if I can find a, a little shooting head that's 14, 15 feet long, put a 10, you know, 10 foot tip on there. Mm-hmm. Um, I've found those to be, there you, go. you know, to my liking. I mean, yep. um, yeah. And, and you're talking about, like you said, small brushy quarters, um, you know, it's, it's there. I mean, it, it, you're, you're talking about tighter than a switch rod even, yeah. Uh, and the ability to do some kind of neat stuff with 
you know, as you progress in your your skills, some side army type stuff and adding halls to the mm-hmm. cast and uh, you can get some stuff in there. Exactly. Yeah, there are some uh, yeah. underhand casts and some. Uh, what are the other weird? Uh, there's all sorts of weird names. That oh yeah, there, and, and they don't even. I mean, you, you, after at, after a while, you just start doing stuff yeah. that doesn't, doesn't have, have names. Any. And, I mean, you, you, it the, all comes down to the how, bow and arrow uh, cast. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, how how confident you are, and and how little you care about your fly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> put putting it in danger of limbs and and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. Um, I guess that's why you should be tying uh, if you're in those tight cores tie more of the five minute fly as opposed to the 45 minute intruder oh yeah no thanks the four yeah the 45 minute intruder um (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah cool so i I was thinking uh you know as i was i usually don't do too much research into my guests as far as you know when i'm getting going on these because i like to be surprised i guess but Mm -hmm. uh you know i was looking around a little bit and i mean you've written quite a bit out there on uh with different publications and things like that maybe you can do a rundown as far as some things that, you know, people can kind of look up from what you've done. I, I can't remember, maybe just know a magazine or two that you've written for, or maybe you still are writing for. You know, I, I've never, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any print magazine affiliations or anything like that. But um, if there's if there's any anyone that I've kind of written for the longest, um, it's the website sexyloops.com, which okay. is a fly fishing and casting website um you know based out of the uk but is is pretty worldwide at this point yeah, and are. um paul arden is the the founder and and guru of that site and and i got to know paul um geez must have been 2005 or 2006 and i actually i actually met him through uh justin spence who is one of the owners of big sky anglers it all kind of comes together oh, okay but, um, Paul was in the U S and, and we ended up fishing together a bunch and, and hit it off. And, um, I had always kind of had an interest in, in the writing side of things. I used to write a fishing report a long time ago for the West Yellowstone newspaper when I was living there and, um, you know, started writing for those guys, I think around 2007 and, you know, I was doing it every week for a long time and then I took a break for a long time and then I came back and I'm, I'm doing that every other week and uh, more cameo spot sometimes mm-hmm. but uh, okay. I think yeah so that, if there's any place that you can find the most stuff I've ever I've written is is probably on sexy loops okay. um, perfect and then and now um, you know I'm contributing to the blog at big sky anglers uh as well Mm -hmm. and sometimes there's some overlap between those two sites which is kind of fun um trying to think what else you know you mentioned the modern steelhead flies book Mm -hmm. that was really cool um cool thing to be a part of and you know a couple of you know guest blog appearances here and there for uh, i had one or two on ray jeff sports blog the Mm -hmm. echo echo airflow guys based out of Vancouver. Sure. Um, yeah, they have a lot. They have a lot of content there for for sure. Yeah. I'm. Oh, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting something here, but yeah, kind of all around. I, yeah. I think if if you Google, if you Google it, you'll find something. Mm-hmm. Um. Hope. Hopefully, not anything too old, because I think some of my writing has improved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice. Well. Uh, yeah. I'll provide. Yeah. Uh, I'll find a link there to the sexy loops and uh, and provide a link uh, in the show notes as well. Yeah. So what about for you, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, a book or magazine or, or resource, do you have a favorite, um, book that, you know, that comes to mind as far as, I mean, I guess we could talk steelhead or, or just anything in general and, and fly fishing. Oh, I, I, I love books for yeah. sure. Um, you know, I, I think, oh, kind of on the same topic as what we've been talking about, you know, Simon Gosler, single hand fly casting. Mm-hmm. Um, is an incredible resource. Okay. Um, or Simon Gosler single and spay cast yeah. is the name of that one. Um, Jason Borger recently came out with a kind of updated revised version of his single handed, uh, single handed casting book. And it, it's a, a masterpiece as well. Um, you know, if you're an instructor or anything, anybody can learn something from Jason. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think as far as steelhead fishing goes. Um, 
Can we talk DVDs too? Oh yeah, yeah. Any 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 resource I, I throw out there? The I usually ask people too about an online resource, trying to dig in there a little bit, and that's usually a tougher one to to come by. But no DVDs, whatever it comes to your mind. I um the the Skagit Master Two DVD with Scott Howell. Oh yeah, I think is is incredible in its um, insight on how to fish sinking sink tips and weighted flies nice uh, i don't think i've ever seen it broken down so clearly and in visual and, and made visualized um i think a lot of people just kind of throw a sink tip and a weighted fly out there and let it swing yep um and um i'd say have a look at that um perfect that and and, and listen and, and watch but also learn um from what scott does and 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 what what he does but does not talk about i think um is pretty incredible um Hmm. just the way i think just the way he approaches the river and and just different things that you know um i'm i'm a big fan of setting the hook uh on steelhead Mm -hmm. you know letting it letting the weight load up and then and and but also really really hitting them Mm -hmm. um because their mouths are incredibly hard. I've, I've had bad luck losing fish. I guess we're a bit of a tangent, but I've all, you know, been fortunate enough to have enough steelhead take my fly and, and that I've tried some different stuff. And I've always felt like, at least in the way that I swing the fly, if, if I don't hit them, I, I don't usually land them. Hmm. Or I, I land, a, I, I land a, a much smaller percentage of them mm-hmm. uh, than if I get a good good solid you know once i feel the weight of the fish on there really really get a good hook set in so sure sure yeah yeah no that's awesome that's uh great stuff for sure the skagit master uh masters that's uh two is uh definitely a great a great resource so i'll uh i'll link up to that there i think that's a uh a paid um a paid series or whatever but um but yeah i think they're pretty reasonable if, if as far as and it sounds like you've you verify that they're they're probably worth the money if you want to learn about sinking lines and things like that. I, I think that one in particular, you know, I, that's one that I've actually had. The, I had, you know, the actual DVD of probably. The, the, do they even have those anymore? Yeah, you know that's I mean? the thing. I, I was talking to <laughs> us. I was talking to Simon. He was on episode uh, nine, and we were talking about that. How Rio's going more towards you know, more of the blogging and providing videos through there because yeah, DVDs. I mean, it's all yeah, streaming. I mean, YouTube things like that. So I, I mean. DVDs are appear to be on their way out slowly or maybe fast, but yeah, no, no, there's, there's still some out there and I still got my Rio, you know, that was the DVD that got me, that got me going. And, uh, that's, yep. that's still on my shelf right next to, you know, all my other steelhead stuff. So yeah, I've got that one. I think that one's on my shelf actually next to the little, uh, if you go way back long enough, you've probably got people that remember when the, the Rio fly lines came with that little tiny book uh-huh. In the fly line box with you know Jim Vincent and Simon pictures of them. Oh, uh, cool! Uh, breaking down the basic casts and that's awesome. Um, and that yeah, that's that goes way back. I I learned a lot from those. Yeah, that, totally, totally. Nice. Nice. That is good. Uh, yeah. So uh, I one of the questions I always like to ask, just to, you know, I know it's not critical all the time with flies, but do you have a well? Maybe you could, if you want to talk about your the flies that you have highlighted in in Jay's book, or if you wanted to. Um, you know, just if maybe you have three, you know, a couple more new steelhead flies you'd like to use now, your kind of go-tos. You know, uh, I, I, I'm i kind of on the, you know, we were joking a little bit about the 45-minute intruder. Yeah. Um, I think that there's different steelhead anglers in different camps. And, you know, really the whole thing is all about just, you know, having a good time um, yeah. and, and doing something that you enjoy. And... Uh, I, I feel like people sometimes fall, steelhead anglers fall into different camps of, you know, the style of flies. And, and, and I've always kind of been in terms of like sinking, sinking line, kind of bigger flies. I've always been on the very basic side of, Mm -hmm. uh, of things. And so the, the, you know, a black string leech, you know, I'm sure my buddies are going to hear this and be like, yeah, of (laughs) course. Um, it's pretty difficult to find uh, a steelhead anywhere that, you know, at one time or another won't eat a black, black leech. 
um, you know, maybe put a little uh, of blue or a little bit of purple or a little bit of flash or, yeah. or something else in there. But, uh, you know, black stripper rabbit um, and maybe a little egg sucking head is a hard one, yeah. hard one to beat. Um, and, you know, but I, I think in the opposite end of things like, um, you know, in the summer fisheries, you know, mm-hmm. to shoots, things like that, I, I've always kind of been drawn to the kind of the hair wing style patterns. And, yep. um, you know, I think at the same time, you mentioned, you know, specific, specific names or specific flies or whatever. I mean, I think over time, my fishing buddies and I have probably, you know, you see something and then you modify it a little bit and then, you know, you kind of make it your own, whether it's better than the, right. better than the original or not. It's, it's your own. So it's neat. Um, but, uh, for you some, know, aside from the, what's that? Oh, I was just going to say for summers, do you like to go really, uh, really uh, more buggier and, and that, or do you have a different size preference or do you kind of standard green butt skunk? Uh, do you have a name of a fly or, or anything? Yeah. Like that? I, I think if, you know, my own tying style is pretty, I would call it, I would say sparse, uh, buggy, you know, I prefer kind of like, you know, picked Natural. out dubbing, picked yeah. out dubbing bodies, um, in, in a variety of colors. But I mean, you know, if you're talking about a river like the Deschutes, you know, purple is, you know, kind of a no brainer, black, black yeah. and white variations. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the peacock bodied stuff, um, yeah. The, uh, the, are just the are royal, just awesome stuff. The royal tree. I was talking to Joel at the uh, one of the uh, uh, tying expos, and yeah, the royal treatment is uh, another shop and fly that's uh, yep. pretty peak. I mean, super peacocky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've like you know thinking of my own variations. I've got one. You know, it's essentially a, a green butt skunk variation, but there was a you know, kind of I like flies that have kind of stories behind them, and there was a. There was a year, gosh, I don't know what it was, probably maybe 10 years ago even, where there were a bunch of uh, California ground squirrels kind of infested the Deschutes for a year. Mm-hmm. That, um, and, and, you know, they're also known as the Gray Digger. Mm-hmm. And I ended up uh, kind of modifying a green butt skunk with some squirrel, and I, I came up with this fly that I ended up calling the Gray Digger. <laughs> And uh, it's, you know, become a, basically a staple in my own steelhead fishing. And it's, you know, it's essentially your your green butt skunk, white, black, green, buggy, sparse kind yep. of variation kind of a thing. Um, nice. And, uh, you know, it's a fun, fun one to tie on. And, yeah, exactly. Um, is, is that one that uh, you can't really find out there anywhere? They'll just have to... Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not really one that's, you know, you're never going to find it in a, in a shop or anything, but it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty simple, you know, Yep. green butt, black and squirrel. Oh, and squirrel. And that's it. Yeah, totally. And a little bit of know, a, a little bit of a hackle. Yeah. A little, you know, a little collar, you know, black collar, sometimes put a grizzly collar on it, you know. Okay. Any flash? No, that one doesn't have no a, flash. any flash. So in just it. the white, no. just the white wing, and which is kind of yeah. cool because those old traditional white. I'm not sure exactly why they historically used just the white, but I guess part of it was they didn't have flashaboo and things that stuck out, so the white sticks out pretty well. That's and it's yeah, I mean, I use the squirrel for the wing. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You're using you're using more grayish. So it's got the well, it's the speckles, and I think that's kind of what you were oh, talking yeah. about—that kind of natural bugginess and yeah. kind of to it. And you know, you see a lot of flies like that. I mean, coachman um, type yeah. patterns that you know they aren't just that um, blob of strong blob of color. They're you know, there's something in there. You know, the same way you know, trout trout guys love their you know grizzly hackle because it kind of makes that makes it look like it's moving maybe when it's not moving or, Mm -hmm. you know, there's good contrast. Who knows what it is, Sure. you know, you know, the main thing is you believe in it. Yep. And and if you don't believe in it, I would, I would recommend cutting it off immediately. Yeah, (laughs) that's right. (laughs) And and putting on one, you do believe in it. That's right. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. No, this is great stuff. I, I, I love, uh, I love digging into a little bit, a little bit of this, uh, kind of the fly stuff here. We, I've definitely had some people on that have talked about the history and, you know, of, of kind of steelhead flies and stuff, but, um, yeah, just thinking, you know, more about your history, kind of where you've come from and stuff. I mean, 
I get a lot of people too on the show that are new guides, people that are kind of thanking me for providing the great content and things like that. And, and I've had other people like Tom, you know, I mentioned before Tom Larimer, who was a guy and then he got out of it and did some other stuff. I mean, what, Mm -hmm. what kept you, did you ever have any, you know, thoughts of just going all full time in this fly fishing kind of business thing? I mean, I know you got, sounds like you got a great job with what you're doing, but did that ever cross your mind? Yeah, I did a long time ago. Um, and, and, yeah. and why not? And what was the thing that kept you from I get, maybe being smart and not, not going fully into what sounds like, I don't an know. Yeah. um, you know, I think, you know, at the time I didn't see, um, I didn't see a way to deal with winter. Um, at least where, you know, where I was fishing out and I was guiding in Yellowstone. Yeah. Um, and so our, our season there was, you know, late May, early June through kind of October. And, and in terms of, you know, people really coming out and, uh, guided fishing, you know, the weather gets pretty cold, um, where people aren't necessarily, uh, willing to, to risk it. Um, or if they are, they're just kind of happy to do it on their own. So, I mean, there was a big chunk of the year where, you know, it was kind of like, what are we doing? And, yeah. you know, I was, I was tying flies and uh, doing, doing different stuff like that. But at the same time, I, uh, you know, came around and, um, uh, I think I found out that, you know, stream restoration was a thing. And, you know, honestly, when I, when I went to undergrad school, I didn't know that was a thing. And, and I had found out about it and it, that was really appealing to me. I think, uh, you know, I really enjoy I think all the different kind of learning aspects of fishing and being on the river, learning about how the river's working, how the different kind of components of the ecosystem interact with each other. And, and, um, yeah, I think that that kind of worked out well for me. Um, yeah, that's, that's cool. Tied yeah. Into that. yeah and, 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 you know, I think probably sometimes too, I'm not always, a uh, you know, a big time, uh, outgoing people person. So, um, you know, day after day with new people sometimes, um, even though they're all, you know, could be the greatest people just kind of, yeah. uh, maybe it wasn't the perfect fit for me, but yeah, no, that, um, that, that, that makes sense. And I, I think about my history too, a little bit. And it's funny because I was just listening to, I'm not sure if anybody out there listens to the Drake cast, but, um, Elliot, um, you know, who's doing a, putting together a great podcast over there. Um, he had Hank Patterson on, you know, who is the, you know, the greatest fly fisherman in the world or <laughs> the greatest guy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the first time I heard that guy, it was like, wow, this guy, this is, this is bad. But, you know, that, now that I listen to it, it's actually, it's pretty, it's pretty entertaining stuff. And, but he was talking about as himself in the episode, he wasn't Hank. He was just talking about the whole thing. And, yeah, you know, he, he digs into a lot of this stuff, actually what, what we're talking about here in, in kind of the struggles of, you know, being around people and stuff like that. And yeah, it's not easy. I mean, I know in my guiding experience, uh, that's a challenge. And then you got to get people into fish too. Right. So, I yeah, mean, I mean, that's, yeah, when it's a bad day, you really have to be good at your interpersonal stuff. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll say being a fishing guide is probably one of the hardest jobs that I know of, um, for a lot of different reasons, you know, interacting with people, but also, you know, really knowing your fishery and, and, you know, it's, it's not those, the days where all the fish are up and, and eating, you know, those aren't the days that make you a good guide. It's the, it's the tough ones and eking it out and, you know, really understanding the nuances and, 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 you know, having to be out there every day. Um, yeah. And it's pretty cool. You know, I happen to have, a bunch of buddies who are, I consider really, really good guides. And, um, oh man, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm always impressed, um, yeah. by what they're up to. I, yep. and I, you know, I learn a lot from them, you so, know, it's pretty great. I, I think I've found a great, great gig, you know, for myself where, you know, I enjoy fishing my, for myself. And I also, if I, it, you know, my guiding now is, is, you know, I, I still get to guide my, my mom and dad and I, you know, my wife and, and one of these days here, maybe my little, my little kid mm-hmm. and my friends and, and, you know, 
pass things along that way. Um, yeah. and just, uh, Yep. Just kind of enjoy it that way too. So totally. So so as yeah. far as your your writing and working in the fly shop, I mean, why do you you know you you stick with that? I mean, obviously there's a lot of work there. You know, I imagine it's not all monetary as far as doing that. What what keeps you going there? And then you know, in long term, is this something that you you know you see yourself continuing to do? Yeah, I mean, I uh, so I mean, I enjoy. Um you know, I enjoy sharing some of the things that I've learned. And I, I think, you know, you look back and all of us have probably have some sort of mentor or, you know, inspiring figure in fly fishing, thing like that. And, you know, maybe if I can be that for somebody or kind of open somebody's eyes and, 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 you know, I never really thought about this as getting older and older and older as I guess we all are just, you know, giving a little something back, um, to, uh, a pursuit or a sport or whatever we want to call it, um, that, you know, has given me so much in my life and, uh, pleasure and good times. And, you know, most of my best friends I've met through, through fishing and, um, it's, yeah, it's just nice and it's easy, you know, when it, when it doesn't feel, um, hard and when you know with the, the guys at big sky anglers are good friends of mine and it's i enjoy you know i enjoy helping them out and that's yeah i, I, yeah. I think that's why i think that's why i still do it if it started to really bug me uh, you know there's really nothing stopping me from um yeah. from disappearing and, and and you know buying a new truck so nobody knows where i am <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. or something like that and that's right and just kind of like you know, creeping around all the, the little streams in Montana and yeah, and yeah. <laughs> that is pretty cool. No, that makes total sense. Oh. You're right though on the front that I just think about my, my friends and, you, and you're totally right. I mean, gosh, they all are pretty much my, my fishing buddies. I mean, you know, thinking of, uh, you know, shout outs to Tyler and, you know, Russ and Shannon, actually Tyler's up there and, uh, up there in your neck of the woods, up on the, um, up on the flathead in that area. Oh, nice. Yeah. He's doing some biological work up there, but, uh, yeah, man, it's totally true. I mean, all, all my best friends are, are all, all my fly fishing buddies. So I, I guess that's kind of the way it works. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's interesting too, how maybe, you know, you meet somebody, uh, with a shared experience or a shared, shared interest, like fly fishing, but, um, you know, it, it has to go, it has to go beyond that. Uh, yeah. for them to, for them to become a true friend and, a, 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 you know, a big part of your life is, yep. it's not just that you guys like the same flies. Um, <laughs> you have to, you have to click on a lot of different levels and it's, it's pretty neat. Yep. Yeah, for sure. No, it's cool. Well, we're, uh, we managed to almost get, uh, get ourselves into about an hour here. I, I had a couple, oh, wow. more, couple more questions here. If you, if you yeah. have a little bit of time, um, so actually, I was kind of a couple of these I've already been scratching off. I was kind of thinking uh, it's some stupid questions now that I look at them, like things like, you know, is is single handed spay a fad? <laughs> you know, that's obviously not. I just think of myself. I mean, I've been doing it myself and, and just for trout fishing, you know, and it's, it's just handy. You know, I mean, there's a lot of places where, you know, it might be the best yep. way to get your fly out there. And I'm, I'm going to be doing the salmon fly trip here soon. And I think this year I'm probably going to do a lot more of the, the spay casting. Yeah, you know, I think spay principles are are not a fad, and, and, and I mean, you know, if if roll casting, you know, roll casting is obviously a a, a key element to almost everybody's yeah um, single handed fishing. Spay casting is essentially roll what casting, roll casting plus. Yep. Um, yep. You know, changing directions. Um, yeah, you think I, I guess something pop, pops into mind. You think you're kind of your standard issue uh, scenario on a trout river. Maybe you're you're drifting some nymphs, or you know, maybe even a dry fly. But you know, at the end of a nymph drift, your stuff's kind of downstream, you and you need to get it mm-hmm. change directions and kind of out from you. And yep. I don't know any better way to change direction uh, than you know than to do a spay cast, whether it's a you know, just a quick double spay, flop it up, 
bring it around and, and pop it back out. And then, and then once it's on the water, kind of mend and, and manipulate your drift that way. Or I, the more you think about it, I guess, or the more, the more you have that tool, um, in your angling toolbox, I think the easier it is, uh, to find places to use it. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I, I encourage people to, to, to learn some space stuff with single handed, <clears throat> excuse me, um, mm-hmm. single handed rods and, you know, look up switch casting, which is basically kind of your, your live line roll cast, uh, which is kind of the building block of virtually all spay casting. And, you know, if you're out there on a, on a casting pond, or if you're out there on a, a, a real pond or, or, you know, out here in front of my house, when, when we, when the snow melts too fast, there's a big giant puddle in my street. I can even, I mean, I can throw a spay cast out of that puddle too. And just, you know, practice that switch cast, like anchor placement, power application, timing. And yeah. That's it. Yep. It'll, I think it'll make your, your fishing more enjoyable. Yep. Yep. For yeah. sure. Cool. So I've got a, uh, so I've got enough time for uh, one more question. I was going to, I'll let you choose. Do you want to tell me your, uh, a couple of your favorite, your best, biggest mentors, or do you want to tell me a cra- a good, crazy fishing story? Oh man. I, I think I'll go with, I mean, men got to go with the mentors. Yeah. <laughs> good. <That's true. laughs> we, we loop back around on the crazy fishing story. So, yeah. um, well, I, I mean, plenty of mentors. I, I mentioned my mom and dad. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they were huge and, and just kind of introducing a different kind of a lifestyle, uh, living in, oh, yeah. in campers. And That's pretty cool. <clears throat> so did you, did you love that when you were doing it? Was it just like the greatest thing? I don't think I knew how much I loved it Yeah. at the time, you know, how neat, how neat that really was to do. That's amazing. Um, yeah, like just, you know, our, how, how conscious you can be of something like that when you're, you know, eight, nine years old, 10 years old, yeah. teenager, you know, when you're a teenager, you're what you are, what you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, so yeah, my mom and dad, and then, um, another, another big mentor is a, a, a good close family friend of my mom and dad, a guy named George Tanfield. He, actually taught my mom how to cast back in the seventies, taught me how to cast in, uh, what was it? Probably eighties, early eighties sometime. Wow. And, and yeah. And so, you know, just a, you know, huge influence kind of, um, and just, just lots of people, you know, uh, over the years, uh, Justin Spence, one of the owners of big sky anglers, he's been a friend of mine since, oh, gosh, year 2000 or something like that. I mean, and I mean, his, his spirit and just like how excited he gets about everything and, and also his experience and he's traveled it all over the world, Patagonia and oh, cool. all this stuff. And, you know, I think he just, he keeps me going too sometimes and yeah, yeah. just great. Just like anybody <laughs> that you can bounce stuff off of. Um, yeah. And then, and, you know, as far as people that probably, probably somebody's ever heard of before, I mean, uh, Oh, Brian O'Keefe, mm-hmm. <coughs> excuse me again, mm-hmm. uh, just a great guy, um, always willing to share. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, totally. Lefty Cray. Oh yeah. Uh, speaking of timing, I yeah. guess, uh, you know, we lost Lefty, I yep. guess a week ago. I mean, yep. <coughs> excuse me again. Yeah, yeah no, I know I'll let you get a, I'll let you get a drink of water there. I, uh, I, yeah, Lefty Cray was, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because I mean, obviously he influenced everyone and was, was huge. I didn't have a ton of, I mean, he was more of on the other side of the, the country and didn't connect as much on the steelhead end, but I'm sure I'm, and I'm going to do my best to do a little bit of research and, and see, get his steelhead uh, background too and here, try to make those connections. Cause I'm, I'm sure they're out there. I don't think that anyone that fly fishes uh today isn't or hasn't been influenced by something that lefty did 
Yeah. Uh, whether you know it or not, like it's, it's that deep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, I mean, yeah, totally. It, yeah. He, I mean, a giant and just a great guy. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I got to meet him a long time ago once. And oh, no kidding. Just, uh, just at a show, you know, like a sure. tackle, tackle dealer show. That's and, awesome and, though. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I was a kid, I had been 20 years old or something like that. And I was up at the, you know, on the casting pond and, <laughs> um, lefty got up at the casting pond next to me and I, uh, yeah, I freaked out. So <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, that's um, right. Cause you, yeah, you were in it as a young kid. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But well, one, one of know. his great quotes and we talked a lot about casting and I, I'm not sure if I'll get exactly right, but you know, you got to have a a good back cast to make a good uh, forward cast or, you know, that's, that, that's, that's right. You know, and that goes to spade casting and, and, you know, normal single handed cast, uh, casting. But, yeah, there, uh, that's right. Oh, I, I heard a, a similar quote. Somebody said there, there's only two parts. There's only two things you can screw up, screw up in fly casting, the back cast and the forward cast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, I just want to check in with uh, here before we let you go and see, you know, maybe the next six months or so, you know, maybe you can let everybody know what you have going and, uh, maybe, you know, yourself or the shop or just kind of what we can expect to see from you. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, it's March, so it's still kind of winter here in Montana. Um, you know, as far as the shop, big sky anglers down in West Yellowstone, you know, we'll get fired up. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we're open, we're, we're open all the time, but, um, you know, things really start picking up around Yellowstone country and in, in, uh, kind of middle of April and then Yellowstone park fishing season opens Memorial day weekend. Um, and then, you know, from there until the park closes uh, at the beginning of November, um, it's the place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to some of that mentioned we've got a couple events uh, i've got the spay event coming up uh towards the end of september again that's that'll be fun mm-hmm. um you know as far as me personally just it's uh like i said it's been a cold winter this year so looking yeah. forward to, looking forward to um some open water fishing on the lakes uh-huh. and starting to see starting to see some good hatches uh that'll be that'll be nice. It's, you know, it's fun here in the winter skiing and and fishing when you can. And, uh, but you know, there's nothing, there's nothing like summer, summer in Montana. It's pretty, pretty great. When do you guys crack off the, uh, the ice off the guides and and get out there? Well, I mean, it depends on the year. I mean, um, last year we had open water on a lot of lakes, you know, a week ago this year, we're still frozen up on a bunch of lakes. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, our we have open water um, river fishing available to us twelve months a year. Yeah, assuming you know you don't go out when it's twenty below zero. Yeah. Um, but the other day, you know, I, I was able to get out uh, in the morning for a couple of hours with, with a couple of buddies. It was beautiful. I mean, uh, Missouri River here is is pretty close for us here in Helena, which is awesome. So got out for, got out for the morning. It was 45 degrees, you know, sun and clouds and, yeah. uh, you know, saw a few fish kind of up on the surface looking at midges, but nothing mm-hmm. great. But we, uh, you know, we were, we were throwing, throwing some light two handers and, and found a few fish doing that. It was, that was a great day. Um, cool. Yeah. Cool. So there's uh, yeah. yeah plenty of stuff to do. So I'll, uh, yeah. So if folks want to get uh, in touch with you, where would be the best place uh, to connect with you? Yeah, you can find me through Big Sky Anglers is probably the easiest. Um, I've got an email uh, mclara at bigskyanglers dot com. That's m k l a r a. Okay. Uh, or just uh, you know I do a bunch of the media stuff for them. So sometimes oh, yeah. if you just uh, if you if you send a DM to the Instagram account, uh, okay. I, I, I'll probably see it. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, con- I'll connect with you here after the show. And uh, great Instagram. That's always a good one to see some good photos of what you guys have going. So, uh, yeah, Matt, just oh, wanted, 
yeah, just wanted to thank you for uh, for coming on and taking some time. Um, you know, I think you broke down the uh, single handed spay. We, there's there's been a lot of questions on that, so you're the first guest I've had that's really dug into that. So I, I want to thank you for coming on and doing that. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to talk casting technique over the yep. over the airwaves a little bit, but I mean, if if anybody wants to try to dig in a little deeper. Um, like I said, Simon's book is a great one. You know, you can email me, try to get in touch. Um, I think the biggest thing is it's just not as, uh, it's not as mysterious and, and, and difficult as it all seems. You, no. You, you, yep. No, it's not. Yeah. It's, I think that's the thing that people tend to make it a little harder than it, than it has to be. So, but it is a good idea to stop in your local fly shop and, you know, pick, pick the brain of the people that know. So obviously you'd be a good Absolutely. one and, uh, yeah, great. Well, uh, catch up with you soon and uh i will talk to you and uh, direct people your way if there's any questions very good thanks for your time thanks for having me on it's awesome all right thanks matt talk to you later take care so there you go if you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered just go to wetflyswing.com slash 21 and go to wetflyswing.com slash community to connect with the growing facebook group i want to give a quick shout out to sam bytel on our Facebook group for posting a bunch of great pics this week and sharing some of the links. Sam, connect with me and I'll get you a free Wet Fly Swing t-shirt with the heading Think Steelhead. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and maybe even seeing you on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.